Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, near Poland's border with Ukraine, efforts in aid of those fleeing war. And in Ukraine, civilians mounting a defense with homemade weapons. They have so much power, military power, and you have volunteers. We have, uh, we have power in our hearts. Plus, the mood on the street in Russia. I'm Ian Hanamansi. Also tonight, warnings about what's driving Vladimir Putin. He seems to have hardened his views. He seems to be much less rational. And large Canadian businesses with Russian ownership. Their assets could be targeted right here in Canada. Are oligarchs feeling a pinch? This is The National. This is Pashamo, Poland. We are about 10 kilometers from the border with Ukraine. This is on an escape route right out of a country that's being torn apart by war. And have a look around. This is the parking lot of an abandoned supermarket. And all day, all night long, buses have been coming in from the border. And when they arrive, there are volunteers standing by. They have food, water, clothing, information on shelter. Over here, they're offering them SIM cards. There are about 10,000 people who come through this very spot. All of them have been fleeing war that's been raging for a week. Seven days of intense fighting that has driven a million people to flee. This is what the UN calls the swiftest exodus so far this century. It includes so many who are coming here to Poland. But today, interestingly, is the first time the Russian military has admitted to any casualties at all. It says just under 500 soldiers have been killed so far. The true number on both sides, that's impossible to know right now. It is almost certainly far higher. With those losses, Russia is also reporting some territorial gains, but the Ukrainian people are not giving up. From here in Pashamasho, let's head over to the border to the city of Lviv, Ukraine, where today Susan Ormerson got a first-hand look at the resistance to Russia's invasion. Ukraine's two biggest cities under intense pressure. Kharkiv today and tonight, a big blast near the train station in Kyiv. The city's mayor says the war has prompted a huge patriotic movement, and we found part of that at an old factory district in Lviv. They're called Lviv smoothies, a mixture of gas and oil. Lit on fire, they turn into Molotov cocktails. We can't show you exactly where they're made, but an army of young Ukrainians have been busy organizing donations of water, clothing, medicine to be sent to the front lines. And last weekend, a truck full of smoothies. In an old factory bomb shelter, they barely pause for the air raid siren. Students, young professionals, moving supplies, organizing to fight the enemy, the Russian invaders. I'm angry, angry. I don't have right. I'm angry to Russia because uh, we, are, we were living nice. Uh, after 30 years, uh, finally uh, raised from that Soviet Union and uh, we want to Europe. We want to be part of uh, Europe Union. Oleg Boyanivsky is 28, a lawyer helping to organize a movement like the young Ukrainians who toppled a president back in 2014. Like in uh, 2014, like Maidan, uh, we are all communicate and uh, everyone said, we have friends there, we have friends there, and uh, everyone uh, sent their help from abroad uh, and from Ukraine. They have so much power, military power, and you have volunteers. We have, uh, we have power in our hearts. They are powered by patriotism and fury. Ukrainians are preparing, protecting their homes in the Lviv neighborhood a sandbag fortress and a checkpoint to keep them safe from Russian sympathizers. A list of license plates warns of suspicious cars already in the city. Nazar is 23. Will you fight? If required, I will defend my country. If the war goes long, a resistance could become an insurgency a fierce foe for an invading army. You have to put your energy somewhere, right? So, you're, so we put it into barricades. 
What do you think is going to happen? I think we're, we're going to win this war, right? <laughs> There's no any options. Back in the bomb shelter, Oleg and his army are just getting started. Slava Ukraine! Glory to Ukraine, they shout. Glory to the heroes. But resistance won't come easily. Russians are battling to control southern cities, the first to fall, Kherson, a strategic city along a corridor that could open up to link Russia through to Crimea. And in Kyiv, increasing pressure night after night as people shelter in place, wondering if that huge Russian armed convoy will advance on the city. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. And as you heard Susan mention the southern part of Ukraine, let's have a look there now. This is where a massive barricade is forming outside the country's largest nuclear power plant. Hundreds of workers and locals, many of them holding Ukrainian flags, are seen here blocking access to the plant to keep the Russian forces out. Russia says its military has already taken control of the area around the plant. So if Russia was hoping its invasion of Ukraine was going to be quick and easy, it was mistaken. Adrian, both sides are seeing victories and setbacks too. Russia's push into the country continues from four directions, from Belarus towards Kiev in the north, from Crimea in the south, from the Donbass in the east, and towards Kharkiv in the northeast, where troops have been repelled, but airstrikes continue. This unverified video purports to show the moment Kharkiv city center was hit. It marks three days now of heavy bombardment and civilian casualties. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second largest city, very close to the border, but so far holding against Russia's advance. Russia has been more successful in the south. The strategic port city of Mariupol reports being surrounded and continuously bombarded. As Susan mentioned, in Kherson, Russian forces appear to be moving freely the first large population center they've captured so far. The prime focus of Russia's forces is Kiev, but the 60-kilometer-long convoy heading there is barely moving, and there's stiff resistance along the way around Irpen. Ukrainians have hit advanced forces hard here, fortifying the area. The response from Russia, devastating airstrikes, hitting homes in Irpen and targets in Kiev itself, raising fears of what's to come. I hope all this violence and cruelness end soon. Ukrainian and Russian delegations are set to meet for a second round of peace talks. So far, though, we're not hearing a lot of optimism that it will stop the fighting. And Adrian, Canadian officials were near you today. Yeah, absolutely, Ian. Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs was here in Poland. Melanie Jolie made some news about new Canadian sanctions, but here it's the humanitarian front that is clearly pressing. If you visit a place like this one or a train station northeast of here, you can certainly feel it. When the bus rolls into Zhashuv, Poland, the exhausted and vulnerable who left Ukraine hours earlier pile on. Not entirely sure where it's going, absolutely sure it will be somewhere safer. Today, it's to a shelter in Krakow for a week, two, probably more. Even those who can't bear to believe it, know it. Women with sons too young to fight hold them close. For Yana, scared to give us her last name, communication is urgent, local SIM cards a lifeline. My husband uh, was here in Kiev and I was very nervous because he is not online. I can't call, I can't message. The volunteer response is enthusiastic, but at times it feels makeshift and frenetic. Some needs are new and complicated. The problem is because the Ukrainian people have money. have only Ukrainian money. Nobody wants to buy this money. If you can't exchange it, you're stuck. If you have kids to carry and bags too, you're stuck. In the chaos of triage comes a stranger, Canada's foreign affairs minister, to assess the scale of the need. 
Melanie Jolie admits it all took her aback. And so it was very emotional, but at the same time, it made my team and I even more determined to put maximum pressure on the Putin regime. And what does that look like? What does that newly look like, maximum pressure? Well, today we're announcing 10 new sanctions against oligarchs, uh, 10 people that are working in the oil and gas industry in Russia that are close to Putin and his guard. Sanctions take patience, saving lives takes speed. And the speed of all that's happened still stuns. This is 18-day-old Diana. Her mother's face we're not showing you because she's scared. She's a dentist. Her husband of 15 years is now fighting. Their lovely life has vanished. Even if she could get home, she says, everyone is gone. There's no electricity. Nothing, she fears, is left. All that from a war that started a week ago right now. Even though many watched it coming, the military build up the threats, seeing the invasion unfold was still a shock, including for Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. The atrociousness, the weapons that are being used, the indiscriminality of the, of the, of the, of the attacks um, really surprises me. A Canadian diplomat thrust into war. That interview coming up later in the show. So the scheduled test of a U.S. nuclear-capable missile is now postponed. The Pentagon said it wants to avoid any provocation while Russian officials muse about nuclear war. But don't mistake that for backing down. Katie Simpson shows us how Russia seems to be uniting its enemies. We shall now begin the war in process. After two and a half days of debate, it was clear which way this would go. Members of the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly adopted a resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The result of the vote is... Yes. The result... Applause erupted even before the results could be read. Isolation and public shaming, the primary goals of the toothless resolution. Russia's only allies in this vote, Belarus, Eritrea, Syria and North Korea. This is not very much a club that I would want to be a member of. The Biden administration bolstered symbolic moves with new sanctions, announcing it will cut off Russia and Belarus from new technology that would help their military and energy sectors. Additional sanctions on oil and gas remain under consideration. Nothing is off the table. Western allies are bracing their citizens for consequences at home. Le prix du plein the price of a full Le tank of gas, the, the amount of the heating Le bill, the cost is likely to increase, the warned the French president. The vice is tightening on the Putin regime and it will continue to tighten. The support seen among international allies has spread to domestic politics. The British prime minister with a rare moment of support accusing Russia of committing war crimes. In the use of the munitions that they have already been uh, been dropping on, as, on innocent civilians, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in my view, already fully qualifies as, as, as a war crime. Just beyond the view of cameras sat Ukraine's ambassador to the UK, his introduction drowned out by another passionate show of support. These moments haven't softened Ukraine's pleas for more weapons, tougher sanctions, anything that might get the violence to stop. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, today, the International Criminal Court opened an investigation into possible war crimes in Ukraine. 39 member states had asked for one, another example of the international unity that seems to be isolating Russia through sanctions and flight restrictions. Breyer Stewart shows us the mood in Russia as some scramble to leave. In a country increasingly sealed off, it's no surprise that there's a great demand for one of the only ways out. And those leaving carry heavy emotions. I'm also afraid how no whole world will be uh, looking at Russians because of all this move the president did. Yeah, it's like I'm disappointed, I would say. At this train station, some are bound for Helsinki, where they can connect to international flights because much of the world's airspace is off limits to Russian planes. 
Olga Akimova is returning to Spain where she now lives but is worried about leaving her parents behind. It can be most, uh, the situation can become more serious uh, anytime. So I'm really scared, but you know, I'm just hoping uh, for the best. Outside, this pair is playing Russian folk music and dancing, a way they say to try and lift the spirits of a population that they say feels beaten down. They want blockage and uh, pressure to Russia too much now. Anything happened, guilty of Russia. Everything happened around the world. She believes Ukraine should be part of Russia and that this country is only defending itself. Others see Russia as a violent aggressor, but when they protest, they're met by rows of police. Officially, people are being arrested because this protest isn't sanctioned. Under the guise of COVID-19, there can be no public gatherings. But this is all part of an increasingly harsh crackdown on dissent. The media, too, is being targeted. At this protest, we were ordered to stop filming. <laughs> and on Tuesday, two independent Russian stations were taken off the air accused of spreading false information about what's happening in Ukraine. This is frightening, of course, he says. We will find out how serious the impact is. It's all part of an effort to try and control the message at home and silence anyone trying to challenge it. Briar Stewart, CBC News, St. Petersburg. So it is challenging to get real information in Russia, but there is a lot coming out of Ukraine, some today straight to Canada's Prime Minister. Today, Justin Trudeau speaking directly with the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. And Zelensky tweeted out that he thanked Trudeau for imposing sanctions against Russia, but he stressed the need for further measures. The Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, has promised more sanctions are coming, targeting institutions and individuals helping Putin. In fact, as we showed you earlier, Melanie Jolie told Adrian that Canada will place sanctions on 10 more Russian oligarchs. Hundreds are already on the list. As Karen Pauls tells us, the threat alone has coincided with a shakeup at one Canadian company. This is Konstantin Bobkin on Chinese TV three days after Russian President Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. I hope there is no large-scale bloodshed and that after this difficult period, things will be healthier. Days before that, he tweeted his support of Putin's move to recognize Donetsk and Luhansk as independent. For years, Bobkin has been on the board of directors of Winnipeg-based tractor manufacturer Bueller Industries. In this Russian television video, Bobkin gives Putin a tour at Bueller's parent company in Russia. Putin makes a joke about working as a combine operator. But as of today, Bobkin is no longer on the board. Bueller has accepted his resignation to align the organization with the values of the Canadian-based leadership team. But Bobkin retains part ownership in the Russian parent company that owns Bueller. Also not yet on Canada's sanctions list, a much more recognizable name, Roman Abramovich. Best known as the billionaire owner of the Chelsea Football Club, Abramovich announced today he's selling it. The proceeds going to a foundation for the benefit of all victims of the war in Ukraine. In Canada, Abramovich owns 30% of Evraz Steel, one of Saskatchewan's biggest employers. He is incredibly close to Putin. Like He is part of the very inner circle. And how he has not ended up on, on the sanctions list yet is, to me, dumbfounding. This expert says even the threat of sanctions are putting pressure on Putin and those around him. They are deeply, deeply concerned. In fact, I think they're sweating bullets right now because they know that they could be next. Their assets could be targeted right here in Canada. Ottawa hasn't said yet if sanctions are coming to Abramovich or Bobkin, but it did say it's working with the international community to find targets of strategic importance to Russia. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. With punishing sanctions against Russian oil and gas, some in Canada see an opportunity to help meet the world's energy needs. 
As a rights-respecting liberal democracy with the third largest energy, energy reserves on the face of the earth, that can be a force for good. Up next, can Canada's energy sector move fast enough to fill the gap? And I'll be back from near the border with Ukraine, where so many have made the very difficult decision to leave. The surreality of the fact that this is how my family and so many Ukrainian Canadian families left Ukraine at the end of the Second World War. Coming up, I'll speak with Canada's ambassador to Ukraine about the painful echoes of history. Plus, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has not gone according to plan, and some say that has everything to do with Vladimir Putin's handling of it. It's a classic mistake that is made by all tyrants, and that mistake is surrounding yourself only with people who say yes. Longtime watchers of the Russian leader weigh in on his state of mind. The National is back in two. As we keep a close eye on Ukraine's capital tonight, Kyiv remains under Ukrainian control. Among millions hoping to keep it that way is the former Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko. He spoke passionately about that to Power and Politics host Vashi Kapelos. Uh, what is my arm? Yes, I have my arm in my hand. And uh, we uh, do our best to stop Russian soldiers uh, as maximum as we can. Um, with this situation, I can promise you, we will never surrender. This conflict has given a boost to oil prices, even to Western Canadian Select, which hit $100 a barrel today. That's a long way from the $4 a barrel in April 2020, the early days of the pandemic. As Aaron Collins shows us, Alberta producers see an opportunity. Around the world, a chorus of opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're choking Russia's access. Governments imposing stiff sanctions on Russia. In Canada, a ban on the small amount of oil imported from the country. Oil and gas do fund Putin's war machine, and we're working on that too. Russia's energy exports a prime target for the West. Germany cancelled a major natural gas pipeline from Russia. Many European countries looking for alternatives to Russian energy. A need Alberta's premier is eager to fill. As a rights-respecting liberal democracy with the third largest energy, energy reserves on the face of the earth, that can be a force for good. A potentially big opportunity for natural gas producers in Alberta. But they'll face a familiar challenge, finding a way to get to the coast. There were something like 14 LNG projects planned if you go back to like 2014. And today we have one that's under construction and it's obviously been delayed and, and um, is, is probably going to uh, still be 2025 before we see the first LNG shipment off our west coast. The hydrogen from Alberta could also help meet Europe's demand for stable energy, but it would face transportation hurdles too needing to be converted to ammonia before moving by rail to BC for export. Within the next two years, we can have the first shipments. The next, I mean, there's, it's, not, it's not that difficult. We already make the ammonia. We already know what the trains look like. The war in Ukraine makes the need for a stable energy supply more pressing. The world has changed, I think, in the last couple of months, especially in the last few days. And now security supply is going to be a bigger part of the equation going forward. It's an equation made more profitable as energy prices surge. The question, can Canada's producers and governments move quickly enough to cash in? Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. So far, Vladimir Putin's invasion has not gone the way he might have liked it to. And that has some wondering, what's going on behind the scenes? I watch his speeches lately. They seem increasingly disconnected from reality. Coming up, those who've watched him closely for years weigh in on his mindset. The National is back in a moment. Welcome back. You are looking at a Ukrainian rescue team lifting an airstrike victim into an ambulance. The city of Kharkiv has taken some very hard hits over three days of shelling by Russian forces. And increasingly, other cities are also being bombarded. But none of that is good enough for Vladimir Putin. 
His invasion of Ukraine is not going quickly or certainly. Terrence McKenna spoke with people who have studied Putin closely, including one who's worked with his advisors. They offer some insight into this isolated leader's state of mind. During Vladimir Putin's strange televised national security meeting last week, he forced his advisors to, one by one, say that they agreed with his military decisions. He publicly humiliated Sergei Naryshkin, head of foreign intelligence, for stumbling over his lines and suggesting perhaps the worst could be avoided through more negotiations with Ukraine. He should be one of the most trusted advisors in a meeting with Putin. Former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. When he even got the verb tense wrong, Putin berated him. And that is an illustration that none of those people in the room have any sway with Putin. I used to work with all those people in that room when I was ambassador. I know every single one of them. There's no such thing as an advisor to the president in Russia today. Journalist Zoya Sheftalovich grew up in the Soviet Union and now covers NATO and Russia for Politico. It's a classic mistake that is made by all tyrants, and that mistake is surrounding yourself only with people who say yes, only with sycophants. And so what he has is this complete echo chamber, a bunker mentality, where he is not hearing from people who are going to be giving him a reality check. Even if no one is speaking out to Putin, Russians can see evidence of a stalled invasion and military chaos on the ground, not the smooth takeover of Ukraine that was clearly expected. Russian-born American journalist Masha Gessen says Putin underestimated the Ukrainian people who overthrew a Russia-backed president eight years ago. These are people for whom dying for their freedom is not an abstract idea. It is a part of their lived experience of the last eight years. These are people who stood in freezing independent square in the center of Kiev through the dead of winter to win their freedom in 2013-2014, who did not back down when the government opened fire on them. Putin doesn't understand that kind of civil society. He doesn't understand that kind of social cohesion. He doesn't understand that potential for self-organization and that commitment to, to resistance. Today, Ukrainians block the Russian army from approaching a nuclear plant. It's just clear to me that Ukrainians will never submit to this occupation. They'll never quit. There'll be some kind of fighting either with guns or passive civic resistance for the entirety that Putin's soldiers remain uh, inside Ukraine. Konstantin Egert, a Russian journalist living in Lithuania, also thinks Putin has made a fatal miscalculation. He can't just say, oh, I'm sorry that I disturbed your, uh, uh, your lunch. Uh, I'm retreating. He has to play both. He has to deliver especially to the Russians. And by the way, to his constituency, the Russian generals, the Russian security services, and of course the Russian public, some kind of result has to prove that he's done something. And this war with Ukraine will not be a victorious war. It will be a quagmire. It will be a disaster. And I think that quite a few military people understand it. UK intelligence services claim they are seeing strong dissension among senior Russian military officers about Putin's invasion of Ukraine. If you're a high-level person in the military, if you've seen how successful operations run, if you've run successful operations in the past, there's no doubt you're looking at a completely mishandled and bungled invasion of Ukraine. The internet is now flooded with unverified Ukrainian army videos of captured young Russian soldiers who say they had no idea what they were getting into. 
We've chosen to blur their faces so they cannot be identified. They look like they're babies. They look like they have no idea what's happening. They don't look like hardened soldiers. They've been told that they're fascists ruling Ukraine and they're coming to liberate them. And they're stunned uh, when they're not uh, greeted as liberators. Russia has uh, shattered peace on the European continent. What we have warned against... On Monday, facing worldwide condemnation, Mr. Putin lashed out at the West, calling it an empire of lies. A recurring topic in recent days questions whether Vladimir Putin is in his right mind. Many who have watched him for years are not so sure. Journalist Anne Applebaum has written many books about Russia. He seems to have hardened his views. He seems to be much less rational. He seems almost fanatically determined to eliminate Ukraine from the map. Um, in a way that does sound almost genocidal. I mean, the kind of language that he's using is about not recognizing the existence of Ukrainians, um, wanting to eliminate them, wanting to remove them. He has uh, become obsessed with the West, thinks we're out to get him. He thinks we're out to destroy his regime. Uh, and at the same time as he's developed these scary ideas, and as I watch his speeches lately, they seem increasingly disconnected from reality. And when he throws in a nuclear threat, that, that really means, you know, in my view, he's becoming increasingly unhinged. It was chilling to watch the moment when Putin uh, made that nuclear threat. And General Gerasimov and his defense minister, Minister Shoigu, were there. The expressions on their faces communicated a lot of intelligence to me. Uh, they did not seem thrilled with this new order to uh, get their nuclear forces ready. And if you're looking at this war, you're wondering, how does this end? Western media often tends to portray Putin as this evil genius who is maneuvering and manipulating and planning things out and 20 moves ahead in chess. Putin doesn't operate like that. If you look at the way Russia has been operating on the world stage over the past 24 years of Putin's Russia, he just throws things at the wall and sees what sticks. I don't think it's a great tactician to isolate your country as he did in 2014 when he first invaded Ukraine and wiped out you know, billions of dollars in wealth and, and cut off his country. And now today, is it brilliant and savvy to kill women and children in Ukraine and make your, your country look like a pariah state? Uh, I just don't see the, the grand strategy at play here. I think we've, we've grossly overestimated him. As Russia steps up its attack on civilian populations, Mr. Putin will have to come up with an explanation for why he is killing so many of the people he claimed he was coming to save. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. So many have made the painful decision to flee across the border, including Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. There came a moment where the, the windows of opportunity, if we had to react quickly, were going to be closed. Coming up, my conversation with Larissa Galadza on why it feels like history repeating itself. The National is back from Poland right after the break. You are looking at a Kyiv maternity hospital, its basement now doing double duty patient care for moms and kids and a bomb shelter. Now, a lot of those who can leave Ukraine have, including most of the staff of the Canadian embassy in Kyiv. They stayed as long as they could, but they had to leave late last week. And the decision was devastating. Today, some of those staff met with Minister Jolie here in Poland as they regroup, Canada's ambassador to Ukraine, Larissa Galadza, took a few minutes to talk with us about what this moment feels like. What is happening in your head right now when you think about how fast this has happened? I think my head has gone into safety mode. Um, there's still a lot of information coming at us. 
um, sorting out what is correct, what's disinformation, what's urgent, what's important, all of that has to happen in, in real time and, and, and that's tough. What was the moment when you knew you had to go, you had to recommend that it was time to pull out? All along we had really good um, information about what was going on and there came a moment where we no longer had that information and um, and the um, the the windows of opportunity, if we had to react quickly, were going to be closed. Did you have hard conversations with people trying to convince them to leave? With Ukrainians, with with Ukrainians, yeah. Some of those conversations continue. There are people who who just won't leave. They won't leave. They can't leave. Your driver won't leave. He won't leave. As you were coming across. Can you tell me what you're thinking in terms of your own family's experience in Ukraine? Uh, just the surreality of the fact that this is how my family and so many Ukrainian Canadian families left Ukraine at the end of the Second World War. And here it is again. Is there an element of this that still surprises you? I think the atrociousness, the weapons that are being used, the indiscriminality of the, of the, of the, of the attacks um, really surprises me. Um, it's not what we expected. It's not what I expected. Because up, up until this point, up until a few weeks ago, you, you were looking at really, as I understand it, micro changes and, and a real development focus for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we were supporting, uh, you know, reforms of the judicial system. We were looking at how we could support um, major uh, ag infrastructure in, in, in agriculture. We had green energy issues. We were looking at uh, energy sector reform, uh, uh, defense reform, security reform, police reform, supporting women's organizations, all this kind of stuff. Has it erased that? Has this moment erased all that? No, no. Um, the human capacity that's there, the institutional capacity that's there, um, is, uh, will, will, will be there. Um, and what will be even stronger is the determination to do those reforms um, that, that Ukraine was, was making uh, to be part of, of the West, to be part of the European Union, to be part of NATO. And that's not just an overly optimistic view of this moment, that, like that's some, some wishful thinking, you, you genuinely believe that? I genuinely believe that. I genuinely believe that. So the ambassador says there's also a core belief uh, of those leaving, that they will be able to go back, that this isn't like the account she read in her grandfather's memoirs about knowing he likely would never return. This is different. The problem is the Russian assaults grow more threatening by the day, and we're in this nuclear age making all of this horrifyingly new. So that is it tonight from us in Poland. We will be back tomorrow. Over to you, Ian, in Vancouver. All right, Adrian, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. After months of anticipation, Canada's central bank has finally made its move, raising its key lending rate today. The economy is doing well. We no longer need the crutch of such low interest rates. Coming up, what the impact will be on Canadians paying off debts. Welcome back. This is another look at Ukraine's capital, Kiev. It is now Thursday morning, one week since Russia's invasion. Both countries are set to resume talks later today in an effort to end the fighting. We'll continue to monitor the situation in Ukraine, but right now, some of the other stories we're following tonight. Police say 47 Canadians have been arrested as part of a global investigation into online child abuse. This material depicted some of the most horrific abuse of children investigators had ever seen. The RCMP says 12 children have been removed from abusive situations across the country, and nearly 150 have been brought to safety globally. The investigation has led to the opening of more than 800 cases around the world. Thousands of people in the low-lying areas around Sydney, Australia, were ordered out of their homes on Wednesday. Record rainfall caused this dam to overflow and the river to reach major flood levels. 
At least 13 people have been killed so far by recent flooding. That number is expected to rise as waters recede. WestJet has announced a deal to buy Sunwing Airlines for an undisclosed amount. Under the agreement, WestJet would also buy the website Sunwing Vacations. The deal is expected to close late this year, pending regulatory approval. Health Canada is recalling four models of Fitbit's Ionic smartwatches. There have been dozens of reports in the United States of its battery overheating, even burning. About 70,000 of these models have been sold in Canada. If you have one, stop wearing it. Contact Fitbit for a refund, and you can find out more at recalls.canada.ca. Well, one more thing is about to get more expensive in Canada, and that is the debt on variable interest rates. The Bank of Canada hiked interest rates today, and a senior business reporter, Jacqueline Hansen, tells us the target is inflation. From the grocery store to the gas station, Canadians' finances have been getting squeezed from all sides. Now interest rates are heading higher, too. People are in panic. Mortgage broker Rasha Ingrata created a Facebook page to communicate with her clients and try to calm their concerns. They're thinking that their payments are going to go up drastically. Lenders are already passing on the Bank of Canada's first hike. Variable rate debt that's pegged to prime is going up. Take a $400,000 variable rate mortgage. A quarter point increase adds about $50 a month. If there are five more of the same rate hikes this year as markets expect, that jumps almost $300. The economy is doing well. We no longer need the crutch of such low interest rates. So the central bank is raising rates to cool borrowing and hopefully inflation too. To bring inflation down, unfortunately, we have to cause some economic pain and it will take a series of interest rate hikes. Supply chain disruptions, higher consumer demand and energy costs are driving prices up. Plus, the Bank of Canada says the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by Russia is a major new source of uncertainty that will add to inflation around the world. For Canadians living paycheck to paycheck, even a small interest rate increase could be a stretch. How are you going to be able to increase what you have to pay on your debt when you also have to pay more for food and transportation and everything else? Uh, payment received, credit limit. Roy Graham is on a pension and worries how much his variable rate line of credit could cost him if rates keep going up. It's like the camel, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. It just keeps <laughs> piling on. And at some point, it has to break. And that's what worries me. Still, the central bank's hope is higher borrowing costs today will help keep prices from rising out of control in the future. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. A legendary Canadian ballet dancer is putting away her point shoes. A look into her long, impressive career next. Sonia Rodriguez, a principal dancer with the National Ballet of Canada, is retiring after a 32-year career on the stage. She was the longest-serving dancer for the company. Her last show, A Streetcar Named Desire, opens in Toronto tonight, and we reflect back on her career in our moment. I was actually planning to retire last year, and um, then the pandemic hit. You know, they asked me if I would consider staying one more year and, and maintain um, street card as my farewell performance. So I just thought, okay, fine, I'll just enjoy, you know, what I love doing one more year. And I grew up here, you know, like I was 17 when I joined the company and, you know, I, I, I've done everything here. I started dancing quite young. Uh, I did not love dancing when I first started. By the time I was 12, I knew I, that, you know, I had taken over and I, I loved it and I knew I knew I was going to be a dancer. You're getting a look a little bit of what it's like and what it takes backstage to get ready to be a ballet star. What I will be looking forward to is, you know, maybe not pushing my body to dance on my own terms and find little things that make me happy, so expressing myself through movement and, and music and, and, and have that but for myself. The thing about ballet and what little I know of it is that combination of movement that 
appears effortless, but you know it involves such great strength and, and just physically so tough. And so to be able to do that at that level for so many years is incredible. By the way, what inspired her as a girl to get into ballet? Swan Lake. That is the National for March 2nd. Good night.